Yeah, you can go ahead. Can I go ahead? Okay. Well, well, we'll grab our hymn books this morning. We're, we'll start in page 391. We'll prepare our hearts for to worship the Lord and all His majesty. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all of them that obey Him. Hebrews 5 9. So trust and obey. 391. Trust and obey. 391. 391.
refer to here. We go to page 571. 571. 571. My assumption of the cross. Good morning, everyone. I was blessed by the singing. I love to sing. It stirs my heart. I often, uh, Hope you don't mind, I often use my own phraseology when I'm singing and give emphasis in certain parts because that's, singing is an emotion. Singing involves the emotion. A lot of, it involves the mind, but it is, a, it is an emotional response as well. Um, but we are to, in our singing, it is to be theologically sound to begin with. We engage our mind and that we sing sound words. But in that is also the expression of feeling. And so often I will sing with my heart and change the emphasis of the word. So if I sound like I'm somewhere else in the song, I probably am. <laughs> oh my let me call your attention to Romans, the ninth chapter. You know, we've been looking at this, Romans, for over two years. I feel the necessity to keep preaching it, though. Out of the book of Romans, we have probably quoted scripture from every book in the Bible, save just a handful. So while we preach, we've been preaching exclusively through the book of Romans, we have done so supporting everything by what the whole of the scripture says. And Paul himself, in, 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 in the creation of this wonderful book, quotes from the Old Testament, time and time again. We shall not cease to see that in these three final verses of chapter 9. Let me call your attention to chapter 9, verses 30 through 33. But what shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained unto the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone, 
as it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Heavenly and gracious Father, as we look into thy word, that you will bless us with heavenly blessings, with spiritual blessings, with blessings of grace and mercy, Father, with an understanding of thy word. As was already mentioned this morning in John 17 and 17, it says, sanctify them by thy word, uh, by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Father, if we come to understand that, that understanding the truth of God is so important to our sanctification, our being separated from the world and from the flesh and from the devil involves our saturation in the word of God. Teaches us that again in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. That it is the word of God that sanctifies and sets us apart. Oh, Father, that we might always find ourselves immersed in thy precious word. Father, that thy Holy Spirit might move in us to stir us up in a greater love for you that our life will manifest the life of Christ that we should portray Christ in how we speak and how we act oh father we we do lack in these areas we are weak in these areas because of the old man in the flesh help us to strive to be like Christ. Glorify your Son in our midst, I pray, in his precious name. Amen. Amen. We have gone through the majority of the ninth chapter of Romans. This series of sermons has shown that Pharaoh and all the world are subject to the will of God. And we're continuing, we're, we're going to keep the same title to this message because all of these messages deal with the, God's sovereignty is indifferent to man's morality. He, it shows that God works irrespective without any consideration of what man is doing in and about this world. It has nothing to do with man. It has everything to do with God. That the world is subject to the will of God. And that the world and all her people are used by God to accomplish his will in the earth. God's will is always accomplished. His will is always done. And he uses men, wicked men, in doing that. We saw that as we looked at Pharaoh and the judgment that God brought about Pharaoh. We see it in the Assyrians as they came to conquer Israel. God used the Assyrians to suppress the Israel and take them into captivity. Just as he did with Babylon, raising up that wicked city of Babylon and that country of Babylon to come over and to conquer uh, Judah, there was, uh, there was a reason for that. Because of their idolatry and their sin, God raised up these nations to judge them. God had also raised up Israel to judge other nations when he went into the Canaanite land. That was to judge the wickedness and the wicked people of Canaanite. That's why he tried, told them to thoroughly purge the land of the Can Canaanites. Not to learn their ways. Not to do the things that they did. However, they failed in carrying out the command of God. They did not rid the land of all the Canaanites like they were supposed to. And they learned their ways. You know, <clears throat> that is what's happening in the churches today. 
We have not cast out the worldliness and the ways of the world. In fact, we have said, oh, well, we want to reach the world. And what better way is there to reach the world than to allow some of that worldliness to come into our church, to sing some of their music, to take the Bible and to mutilate it and to water it down and to make it more uh, understandable to the people. And they don't do that at all. And as a result, the churches of Christ have become ineffectual in the witness of Jesus Christ. And as we've been seeing, is that in spite of man's morality, this his world and man's worldly views, his views of destiny, you're in control of your own destiny. That in the disposition of man's will, he always carries about his will. In other words, whatever you think your will is, and whatever you think your destiny is, you are going to accomplish the will of God nevertheless. Even though God is not in any of your thoughts, if you're an unbeliever, the Bible tells God, you're not concerned with what God's will is. You're only concerned that you get to do whatever you want to do. But whenever you do whatever you want to do, you'll be held accountable for it, but you will do the will of God. Another aspect of this chapter is that Paul has been showing us that righteousness was rejected by the Jews. That is the righteousness which is by faith, which is in Christ, that was rejected by the Jews. That God had not mistreated them in any way though it was an accusation that God was mistreating the Jews because what he took he took the blessings and gave blessings to the Gentiles in fact in chapter 3 Paul reveals that the Jews actually had an advantage over the Gentiles he tells us that in in this chapter 2 that that they had the 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 oracles of God um they had the 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 let's see Paul says, who's an Israelite as to pertaining adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. The Jews had an obvious advantage over the Gentiles. A huge advantage. You ever watch those... Uh, um, that, that those cooking shows where there's a cook-off, and if you win this win, then you get an advantage over the other contestants. Master Chef, I think it is. So you want to go into the kitchen. You get to choose what everyone else cooks or whatever the case may be. And sometimes it's not as advantaged, as much of an advantage as you think. But here the Jews had a huge advantage over the Gentiles. God the Father had manifested himself to them. They saw the wonders. They had the prophets. They saw the miracles. They had the oracles. They had the priesthood, the divine worship of God that God had established for them. He even gave laws on how they as a nation were to conduct themselves. National things that kept the Jews and or Israel separate from the rest of the world. It kept their economy strong. All these th their, their health was better than others because God had made certain laws for them to obey and bless them. But God was also not unjust to the Gentiles. The entire creation spoke of the eternal almighty God. And while they did not have all the advantages that the Jews had, they still had all of creation was testified of God in his eternality, in his, in his triune Godhead, was all there. So that they were without excuse, they, but rather they, they worshipped the creature rather than the creator. 
And they were found in condemnation just like the Jew because the Jew, while they had the worship of God, they perverted the worship of God for its, of its intended purpose. And while the Gentile didn't have that divine worship, they still had the testimony of all creation to which they rejected and worshiped creatures rather than the creator. They became heathenistic. But let us not forget that even among the Gentiles, God had an elect people. Another point that's important to our text, and we must not confuse national election with personal election. Although he speaks to a degree here about national election, because Israel was a, was a separate nation from all the other nations. That's why all the other nations are called Gentiles. But Israel is separate apart, and the word Gentiles just means nations. Israel was unique, and God uh, chose them out from the rest of the nations and made them a unique nation and gave them promises. So we, we, must, not, but we must separate personal election from national election. And Paul does that very well in this text. God chose out from among all the people of the earth for the place, uh, a place for his name, and that was Israel. Israel was the place where God put his name. This is the nation of Israel. He gave them promises. He placed among them his divine law and his acceptable form of worship. He set up a priesthood and sent them prophets to declare his word. On many occasions, God delivered or saved Israel from their enemies and did marvelous thing in conquering nations around them. There were many miracles that were done on behalf of Israel to keep them safe from their enemy. There were also many times when he delivered Israel into the hands of their enemies for their disobedience. But God always preserved them. The, in, the nations of the earth often became instruments of chastisement upon, the, uh, upon this wicked and rebellious nation. This nation of Israel as a nation still has promises made to them that have yet to be ful fully fulfilled. They are coming. To rightly discern the scriptures, one must know the difference between a national election and where the scriptures speak of a personal election. God has an elected people, elected to personal salvation out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Whenever you read in the scripture, like for instance where it says, For God so loved the world in John 3.16, that, that ought to be interpreted according to the scriptures, which means every kindred and tongue and people and nation. That God has a people out of all of these. Not that the world is a whole and every individual in it, but out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. We use the scripture to interpret the scripture, not man's idea of what they think the scripture means. Election is always positive. We are elected to something positively, not negatively. There are, one of the complaints that we have is that God John R. Rice and others have said it, and and the people of those of those of those schools and teachers uh, preachers have gone to those kinds of schools. They all say, "Well, you see, if God elected some to salvation, then He also elected people to go to hell." You know, I don't see a single place in the Bible where it says that, and I have not heard yet a a Baptist preacher anyways, there might be some on the Protestants, I don't know, say anywhere that God elected people to go to hell. Oh, and they say, well, if God elected some to go to heaven, then he must have elected some to go to hell because they all don't have equal opportunity. Listen, 
If God had not elected some to go to heaven, we would all go to hell. There was no election necessary. God did not have to choose someone to go to hell. They were already going there. They want to, well, they, they live lives that are worthy of being thrown into hell, and so did we. We were no different, except for God had positively chosen us to redemption. Now, that is not positive reprobation. We're accused of teaching that God elected people to go to hell, and that's false. Neither, nothing is further from the truth. Election is, listen, election is not salvation. Election is not salvation. Election is to or toward salvation. God chose us in eternity and then delivered us in time. Our condition before our salvation was exactly the same as those who were not elected. We were still in our sin and under just condemnation. We were all going to hell. There's not a difference in our condition that makes one more electable than the next. God didn't look at Mr. David Hethorn and say, Listen, he's more electable than this guy over here. That's the whole point of what Paul was talking about when he's talking about Esau and Jacob. Esau and Jacob, they were equal to each other. There was nothing between them that was different. Jacob wasn't more special than Esau as far as man was concerned. But God chose Jacob over Esau. He could have just as easily chosen Esau over Jacob, but he didn't. God set his love upon Jacob. He did not love Esau. This is the point of Paul's argument with Jacob and Esau and the potter and the clay. The potter. God the Father can do whatsoever he wills with that which he has created. That which is clay. He can do whatever he wants and the clay has no say in the issue. Election is always inclusive and exclusive. It includes a certain number. And it excludes those who are not elected. The shepherd knows his sheep. He calls them by name. That's inclusive. He, he includes all of his sheep into the fold of God. But he does not have goats in his, shep in his fold. Therefore, it's exclusively sheep. Now, there are a lot of preachers that teach that God changes goats into sheep. That you were a goat, and then when God saved you, He made you a sheep. Do you know that there's nothing like that found in the Scriptures? That would be what you would call extra biblical no i would call that a heresy i would call it a false teaching i would call it deceptive teaching because there's no place in the holy scripture that gives warrant for you to say that the goats are made sheep Since Paul has proved that there's no injustice with God in his dealing with both Jews and Gentiles, he now concludes with a final statement on this whole matter concerning the salvation of the Gentiles. That their salvation rests in the same faith as the Jews' salvation rests in. The faith of Abraham and the righteousness that is by that, that faith. Now that most of the Gent Jews didn't do that. But those who, the remnant that was that is saved, they have the same faith that the Gentiles have, and that was in Abraham, and that is that they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're presented with a paradox. Look at verse 30 and 31. What shall we say then? 
that the Gentiles which follow that not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel which followed not after, which followed after the law of righteousness hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Now Webster's Dictionary, 1828, tells us that a paradox is a tenet or proposition contrary to received opinion and seemingly observed, yet in fact true. In other words, it's, it's something that shouldn't be true, that seems to be somewhat contrary to the normal laws, but it is true. We have several paradoxes in the scripture. Uh, for example, Proverbs 13, 7 says, There is he that maketh himself rich, yet hath nothing. There is he that maketh himself poor, yet hath great riches. Doesn't that seem just the opposite of what it should be? But it is true. It's a paradox. Matthew 16, 25. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. There's a paradox there. Something, a, a, a tenet or proposition contrary to received opinion. If you're rich, you should stay rich. And that if you, that, but you should, that shouldn't make you poor. Now, let's look concerning this first group, the Gentile. But what shall we say then? That the Gentile which followed not after righteousness hath attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. First of all, they are found without righteousness, which is actually true of both the Jew and the Gentile. Self-righteousness is not the righteousness that God requires or asks for. See, there have been great civilizations built by Gentiles or by the nations. The word Gentile simply means of the nations or not Jew, not Israelite. That's all. We, we think that the Gentiles are some separate, you know, we get the idea of Gentile. We don't think of it as nations throughout the world, various nations. We just think it as one group of people and the Jews are somebody else. But the Gentiles are various nations. The Midianites were of the seed of Abraham through Keturah. Yet, they were not the promised seed, therefore they were Gentiles. You see, the seed of Israel, or the seed of Abraham through Keturah, were not considered of the promised seed, therefore they were not of Israel, they were not of the twelve tribes, therefore they were considered Gentiles. The Arab nations are considered Gentiles, are they not? Now, not all Gentiles were pagan. Although most became pagan, the further they got away from Abraham after the flood. Now, Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses... was a priest who worshipped God, the same God as delivered Israel. And he was a priest of the Most High. But he was a Gentile. Melchizedek was a priest of God, a type of Christ, and a Gentile. So all the Gentiles were not pagan, at least at this point. Now whether God continued among Gentiles, those who were not pagan and go into paganism, I, I don't know. I have no knowledge of that. Although it would not surprise me if he did. Because the history that we have from God's word is that of the nation of Israel and the law and the prophets that were given to Israel that's contained in the Old Testament. 
Pagans are those who worship creation or things within the creation and look to them as gods or God. And there's various forms of paganism. So uh, most uh, all the Eastern religions are pagan. And the Romans were pagan and became Christianized. Quotes, yes, quotes. They became Christianized by the, by the fourth century. And all the nations, all the other nations remained pagan till about the eighth century when most were converted to Christianity with that with quotes via the Roman Catholic Church. Of course, in doing so, they incorporated pagan worship into the Christian worship, and there was such compromise and thoroughly, uh, 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 thorough um, apostasy in the Roman Church by that time. But that's but they did, see they declared paganism dead. The Catholics deter, uh, declared paganism dead. You think paganism is dead? <laughs> No. The nations as a whole knew nothing of the God of Israel and were blinded by their corruption against the witness of nature concerning Israel's God. And by the way, paganism is not dead. It is found in Wicca, New Age, Father Time, Mother Earth are all extensions of paganism. Evolution, radical environmentalism are all have their extension and part in paganism. Paganism is by no means dead, but quite alive. We may not find people falling down and worshiping before idols, but we have plenty of idols for men to worship. And they do. Not only being heathen and pagan, we also find that the, that the Gentiles were hedonists. Now, hedonists have de are devoted to pleasure. Hedonism is the seeking out of pleasure. Have you ever heard the slogan, if it feels good, do it? It's been around for a while. Guess what that is? That's pure hedonism. Pleasing yourself, making yourself ha happy, not, not denying your body anything. Do you know that being foodies is part of being a hedonist? You say, whoa, you're equating food with hedonism? Yes, the pure pleasure of the delicacies of eating can be hedonistic. We live in an extremely hedonistic society and guilt for sin and abusive and, and offensive behavior is excused. Because if it feels good, you should do it. Having a child outside of marriage was once considered very, very shameful, but now it's celebrated because if it felt good, you did it. There are no consequences anymore for that. No shame. Society never puts any shame upon somebody like that. Therefore, you know, we wonder why promiscuity is so vast. Because there's no shame associated with it. Wicked lifestyles are accepted because of hedonism. Rome fell because of its hedonistic ways and lifestyle. Sports and Olympic arenas, were they not erected in Rome? Didn't they have great arenas to entertain the people? And the people went to watch things that made them feel good. Do we not have huge arenas today flocked by thousands upon thousands of people and then millions watching on their TVs because they want to see, because that brings them pleasure? Is that not part of hedonism?
games were played. The Olympic Games started in Rome. And the theater was introduced to entertain the public. Temples were filled with prostitutes and worship of gods of pleasure. Whatever feels good, whatever makes you happy, go ahead and do it. All you have to do is watch commercials on TV and you see that they're full of hedonism. Not only were they unrighteous, these Gentiles, they were without knowledge of righteousness. They had no law concerning sin, no sacrifice for the expiation of sin. Now they believed, heathens did, right? That if they, if they got their God angry with them, well, they had to offer up a sacrifice to appease him because he was angry at them. And so those, sometimes those sacrifices were human sacrifices because they wanted to make their God happy. Or God or gods or one of their many gods, they wanted to make them happy. So they would offer up an expiation, but it was not concerning their own sin. It was not because they had personally sinned against God that they looked for some way to have their sins expiated or forgiven. They didn't care about that. There was no divine, no oracle of divine appointment, no priesthood for the ministration of God's law, no prophet of righteousness. The Gentiles had none of these things. Their religion was base. I mean, it was filthy. It was base. Everything was a god, and their gods were cruel. They were debased and as arbitrary as the men that created them. They had profane priests that offered sacrifices to devils and prophets that spoke lies to deceive the people because they were not the prophets of God. They were prophets of demons and prophets of, of, of their baser religion. In Ephesians 2.12, he says, and that, and that at that time, Ye were without Christ. He's speaking to Gentiles. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Is that not true? We were. And then in chapter 4 and verse 18 and 19 says, having the understanding darkened. Man, our understanding was black. It was blindness. Blindness so deep and so dark that we can't even imagine being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that was in them because of their blind, the blindness of their heart who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Isn't that a wonderful description of the Gentile? It's a truthful description of the Gentile. See, they had no desire for righteousness. This is the very heart of depravity. You want to look at the very heart of depravity? Look at the Gentiles. No man has a desire for righteousness because he is totally corrupt in his nature. Totally. You know, I, 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 I just do not believe that all those people who claim that they believe in total depravity actually do. Because they have man doing works that he cannot do if he's depraved. If we understood total depravity to understand a thorough, complete, absolute corruption of mind and body that even in our mind even the best thoughts that we can have are totally corrupt 
that there's nothing good in our thoughts and in our mind. If we would understand that we could bring nothing to God, we have nothing, we're absolutely corrupt and condemnable. But oh no, we have been doing good works in order to get saved. How can a corrupt how can a good thing come out of a corrupt thing? How can a mind of man by any means produce even the slightest bit of faith in God as what we're commanded to by most preachers in pulpits? Amen. You're commanded to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ so that you can be saved. And yet they'll turn around and say that salvation is the work of God. It's all the work of God. It's all the work of grace. And a man cannot believe unless there is something incorruptible within him. That is the new man given to him in the new birth by which he is able to produce the good work of faith and believe in God. We get things so messed up. I, I think that men do not logically think through anything. The Bible is not random thoughts. It is not ideas and opinions. You and I cannot add to the scripture an opinion and, and, call, and then preach it and say this is what the word of God says. You add your opinion to it. You have, you have soured the word of God. The word of God is logical. It is reasonable. You can reason the word of God. There is always a cause and an effect. We must come to learn what first cause is. And first cause is always God. Not something that we can do. Now the evidence of what God has done is seen in faith. You can then believe because the new man now indwells us. The new man is incorruptible. And the new man brings with him the grace gifts of faith by which we now believe and repent and confess the Lord Jesus Christ. But no, we, we don't work that way, do we? Like we ought to. No man desires righteousness because he's totally corrupt in his nature. We like our corruption. Let's be honest. We like our corruption. Even as, new, even as believers... Maybe you don't like this, but even as believers, we tend to like our corruption. <laughs> this is what is meant in the scripture when it says men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. That Greek word loved is agapao and it's in the first heiress indicative active, which means they have an unchanging, settled love for the world and their corruption and nothing else. Because the light of Christ came, but yet they remain so undisturbed in their corruption and in their darkness. They cannot, will not, would not turn to the light. I read a statement of faith one time, or not, not too long ago in fact, and, and I just about fell out of my chair. Baptist Church, and I believe the name... I can't remember the name of the Baptist church. But it said, this is what it said. Sin is an attitude of disobedience and rebellion against God. I read that, I almost fell out of my chair. Because 
So we, because what they're saying is that sin is an attitude of disobedience, an attitude of rebellion. Do we need not see children have an attitude of, of rebellion and an attitude of, of, of disobedience? And what do we tell them? Change your attitude. So what? We just have to change our attitude and therefore we're saved now because we changed an attitude. What happened to the corruption of man? It is not an attitude. It is a condition. It is a condition of rebellion. A condition of, of rebellion and, and disobedience. They can do nothing else. It's not an attitude. It's what they are. How shameful for a church to say anything about it being an attitude. Why, God's going to change your attitude. And you're going to change an attitude and you're saved. No, we need a change in our corruption. We need that which is incorrup incorruptible, which is the new man. You see, to me, that's a big problem. I could never join a church that said something like that in their confession of faith. Could you? The Bible teaches that it is not an attitude, but the total corruption and depravity of man. A righteous life after God, uh, a righteous life after God. Let me read my sentence here before I actually try and say the rest of it because it's not making sense. Oh, a righteous life after God was and is never in the thoughts of unrighteous, depraved men. There is never a thought in unrighteous, depraved men that he could ever, or that he even wants to be righteous towards God. In Psalm 10, verse 4, it says, The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after... Here's the will of man. Will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. That's pretty simple. What is the will of man? Well, we need to appeal to the will of man. And that man can, by his own will, come to God. No, it says that he will not. He will not. God is, he will not seek. His will will not seek after God. God's not in any of his thoughts. Not the God of the Word of God. Not the God of the Bible. Not the God that demands the, His righteousness. It's not in His will. Genesis 6, 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And then God brought the flood and destroyed all of men, save eight souls. Now let me ask you, since the flood, do you think anything's changed concerning man's imaginations and thoughts? Do you think Noah and his sons, they, did, they, they had no... Do you think that their hearts were not evil as well? And their children and their children's children? Listen, it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. I'm telling you that the wickedness of man is still great in the earth. And that men still are wicked. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it continues today because we're the same exact corruption. Nothing has changed. Not only do the wicked reject the righteousness of God, they are antagonistic to it. It is a war-like mentality. We are at war with God, at enmity with God. It is one thing to reject a thing or God. It is quite another to become an enemy or a combatant against God. We just aren't neutral. It's not that we just don't like it. Not that we're just going to tolerate it. It's not a benign unbelief or tolerance of Christ. But instead it is a bitter, hateful, warlike rejection of Christ and his people. You cannot be of a neutral, of a na neutral, that is right, neutral country because you're involved in the fight. 
You are either God's child or you are not God's child. If you are not God's child, you are an enemy combatant against God. Because that is your nature. You say, well, I don't want to be like that. I'm sorry. That is your nature. That's how things are. You do not love God, therefore you hate Him. So says, well, I don't hate God. Yes, you do. You show that by what you do, how you act, how you speak. Your lifestyle demonstrates that you are an enemy combatant and that you hate God because you do not come to Him for life. You do not come to the water of life and receive life, but rather you continue in a way that shows that you are an enemy of the things of Christ. I'm going to pick up on this next week with the same Gentiles, these same Gentiles that I've just preached against about attained the righteousness which is of faith. I did not paint a very pretty picture of Gentiles, did I? But these attained the, the righteousness which is of faith. Father, I pray and thank you for your goodness to us. Your everlasting blessings, your mercies. Father, how great thou art that you would save and deliver wicked men from their sins. And not just that, elevate, glorify, And make us brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. Kings and priests in thy kingdom. Giving us eternal life whereby we shall worship and praise you forever. Thank you for such grace. In Jesus name. Amen.